how many resources should I install in EMDR? This is a real question that a very dear friend of mine who recently got EMDR trained asked me uh, not too long ago. She said, Cambria, you know, when we're in phase two, how many resources should I install? And I got curious about that question for lots of reasons. Y'all know I love thinking about EMDR all the time. Um, because it sounds like there was a lot under it. Um, first of all, I thought to myself, does somebody think there's a right or wrong number of resources to install? And probably there's some confusion either because there is a client specifically um, who might need more resourcing than this person was trained to give or this person might be getting mixed messages from different places about installing one resource versus many resources. So I, you know, I love making videos when something is confusing because <laughs> it doesn't have to be. So today's video is gonna talk about all of that um, and I look forward to hearing your feedback and thoughts about it. Hope this feels helpful. If we haven't met yet, my name is Cambria Evans. I am the teaching and learning EMDR consultant coming from my office in San Jose, California, where I am still virtual after 14 months, um, but getting my second vaccine next week. So very excited about that. I hope all of you have been getting your vaccines. Um, I'm sure you're figuring out whether to stay virtual in person or do a mix of that. Um, but whatever phase you're in right now with uh, this whole COVID transition, um, my hope for you is that it's feeling um, relatively smooth. So let's talk about resourcing. Y'all know that I made a ton of videos last summer about resourcing. Um, you can check out my YouTube channel about that. I talked about how to resource and you know customize them like a brain surgeon. Um, and today's video is going to be around kind of, I think, the mixed messaging that uh, a lot of us get just in general with different EMDR consultants. And um, because I have twins who are almost five, you guys, um, I'm going to think about it from a parenting framework because that's just, that's where my brain is right now. It's, it's parenting 24-7 <laughs> with COVID. So I think that con the consultants, EMDR consultants, are kind of like parents in the sense that... Um, they each have their own parenting style, okay? So y'all have seen this. Y'all have seen that there's, you know, some parents who are, like, really rigid and strict, and they're like, this should be this way because of this, and, like, we're not going to ever break this rule. And then there's some parents who are like, yeah, I read that book about parenting, and, like, that doesn't really work for this kid, so I'm not going to do it that way for this kid. Um, and then there are some parents who are like, yeah, you know what, I'm just going to kind of figure it out. And like, if I give my kids ice cream for breakfast, like, whatever. So there's a whole spectrum of um, creativity, uh, rigidity, um, rule following, um, innovation that I have seen as an EMDR consultant among my peers and colleagues, other consultants. And I and I felt it coming up. I felt it coming up when I got certified and I was an EMDR consultant. I, I felt in the different trainings I went to, I was like, but she just said this and you're saying, it, it's very disorienting. So I think what, what first of all helps us understand this whole thing is that I believe that EMDR consultants are people. And just like everyone has a different parenting style that I believe comes from a good place, um, it's important that you understand who you're listening to, okay? Um, Y'all know that I respect standard protocol, I respect um, guidelines, and I love innovation. I love creativity. I love trying new things because I have two fraternal twins and it is not a one size fits all in my house. What works for one does not work for the other. They're very opposite. So I am the same way with my EMDR clients. And when I have an EMDR consultation group with my EMDR moms groups, um, it's the same. It's okay. What works for this client? Right. Um, so I want to put that framework out for us to think about this. Um, and I'll keep putting it out with videos that come around in the future, but especially for resourcing, I think it's important to think about parenting styles. Um, because some EMDR consultants will say, 
yeah, give them a calm place and let's let's move forward. <laughs> let's move on to processing the trauma target, right? And then you have someone that's more like Parnell that's like, let's give them a calm place and let's give them a nurturing figure and a protective figure and a wise figure. Let's give them an ideal mother. Let's let's do lots of attachment repair, right? These are different parenting styles. One is not right and one is not wrong, y'all. They're just different ways of thinking about how to be um, responsive to a client. It is how to give a client what they need to be able to do EMDR, to be able to do phase four, be able to function, be able to have a sense of secure attachment in themselves, okay? So I talk about a lot of this in the lesson plan course, um, which you can get through Zero Disturbance, but I'll talk a little bit about the resourcing part in terms of quantity today. So how many? Well, let's think about it in terms of parenting, okay? So I don't know about y'all, but my kids beds are covered in loveys. Like I literally had to go in the other day and say, okay, I'm taking all these stuffed animals and miscellaneous toys, putting them on the floor. There's like a hundred things here. I I can't even like make space in the bed for your body anymore. (laughs) I want you to pick five and then we'll put these in your bed, right? And then we'll put the rest in the play area because this is just too many. Like there's no room for you to sleep. Okay. So that was an example of like, there's too many resources that they're losing their effectiveness. Right. It's just a sea of stuff. Um, they were like losing things in their bed when they were sleeping, they were like coming and waking me up. Like I can't find this little tiny ball, like lovey. So let's pick five. Let's have those for now. Okay. And if you want to rotate them out, right? We can go into the playroom and you can pick some new lovies and we'll swap them. But you're just you're no more than five. You can have less than five, but no more than five. Otherwise, it's just, it's too much. All right. So thinking about kids and lovies, right? So lovies are there to do what? They're, the kids can hold them when they fall asleep. They feel an attachment. They feel a relationship. They feel safe, loved, protected, nurtured. And all of my kids' lovies the five that they're still allowed to have in their beds, they each bring up a different uh, emotional experience for my kids, right? So one of the loveys on my daughter's bed is um, Ryder from Paw Patrol, and he is like the leader of the pups, right? He is like the one that knows, he's kind of like the wise figure on Paw Patrol, okay, for these dogs that he's like in charge of on their missions. So she basically has a wise figure in her bed, that has certain characteristics that feel good to her to hold when she falls asleep, okay? She doesn't hold Ryder every night. She might hold her cheetah some nights, which is very soft. So somatically, sensation-wise, tactile, it's a very soft animal that's very cozy for her to hold, right? And I think it's less about the cheetah's characteristics of being fast. It's more of like, it's a baby and it's soft. And that's the emotional experience that she would choose if she was holding her cheetah, okay? So why am I talking about kids' lovies? It's no different for our EMDR clients, y'all, okay? It is no different. Maybe you have a client that wants one resource, that wants one lovey, okay? And maybe that client doesn't care if it's a calm place or a nurturing figure or whatever, right? But here's what's important about this question of how many resources should I install? The question is, how do I talk to the client about what they need to do EMDR? Okay, because while we are in phase two and we are using resource installation as a way to clinically assess if they can stay in their body, keep dual awareness. We're assessing, you know, adaptive resources in the brain already there. We're assessing if they can tolerate the BLS. We're assessing so many things clinically that are informing us about how to do phases three and four and onward. But in terms of the actual emotional experience of the resource itself, in terms of the content of the resource, I propose that we have a transparent conversation with the client about what they need as they move towards this trauma target because I'm not gonna know the answer for every client, right? I'm not gonna know if my kid wants to hold Ryder or Cheetah, depending on the day that they've had and they and how they wanna fall asleep and how they're feeling that day. 
my, my kids are four and I respect them enough to say, what feels good to you? You have choices. And this is reparative, especially with our relational complex trauma clients who have attachment repair work to do. They get to have choice with you now. They get to have agency. They get to be part of the process as a respected adult. Okay. So let's not come from the place of, oh, well now it's time to do calm place. So let's do that for you and move along. Okay. Let's come from the place of we're in phase two. Here's what phase two is all about. Because I respect you enough to be transparent with you about what it is that we're doing together in our therapeutic contract. And here's a couple things we're going to be curious about in phase two. Can you state change? And here's why that's important, right? It's important that we can both see you having the ability to state change for a couple of reasons. One, it builds confidence outside of session to go from like a state of annoyance or disturbance into a state of, I'm in my calm place. I feel fine. Okay. Or can you put things in a container, right? These are all things that we want to see together because when we go into phase four and we're processing a trauma target, we want to know that you can state change if it gets too overwhelming, right? We want to know lots of things about what you can and can't do right now to help us best prepare you for a really successful experience in phase four. Okay. So state changing, we're going to just notice how that works. Are you prepared to do EMDR? We're going to notice that together. And what's the emotional experience you want, excuse me, from these resources? Okay. I had a um, consult group earlier today and my client, uh, my rather my consultee in Louisiana was telling me, I have a client who does not want to do anything with her imagination. She doesn't want to visualize anything. She doesn't want to do figures or made up stuff. And I'm like thinking, okay, perfect. Like let's do some RDI. Let's think of a time that she felt protected or a time she felt strong or a time that she had what she needed, whatever it is, and then stall that, right? It's important we understand what the client needs specifically, right? Before we say, here's your one resource, right? When I was uh, <coughs> pregnant with my twins five years ago, I had literally got a, like so many adult coloring books Uh, I had like a Tupperware full of adult coloring books in my garage. Um, Everybody wanted me to color. And I was like, I don't want to do, that doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't feel calming to me or relaxing to me or anything. That actually feels really annoying. And the people giving me these coloring books were trying to resource me. They were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to love and take care of me. I was like, I don't want to freaking color, okay? Why is everyone giving me this resource that I don't want and I'm not going to use? Okay. And no fault of anyone that's watching this that gave me a coloring book because you know I love y'all so much. Um, but it's the same with clients, right? Don't, don't give them a bunch of stuff <laughs> without talking to them about, well, what's, what's going to feel good to you? And if the client doesn't know because they've never done EMDR before, let's be curious about that together. But I really, really come from... Um, a model of like collaboration and transparency and let's try this together instead of a more kind of directive, we'll say kind of old school medical model of thinking. And a lot of the people that um, were kind of the, you know, OGs of EMDR, the originators of EMDR, the first trained in EMDR, they really grew up in a generation that was um, culturally, it was more normalized to have kind of the more directive, authoritative, Um, medical model, even with physicians. So it's not surprising, again, thinking about parenting styles, right? In the 50s and 60s, um, the parents that raised the people that were kind of the first generation of EMDR clinicians and trainers and um, innovators, there was a different, there was a different culture of parenting. And so it makes sense that some of those cultural aspects have been passed down to us in these trainings. And I think what's so beautiful about Um, thinking in an innovative, creative way, in a client-centered way, is we get to say, you know, parenting research and parenting strategies have come a long way since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, even in the 80s, right, most of us grew up with our parents spanking us. So thinking about parenting styles now and and kind of the emotional intelligence we want to give to our kids, the sense of agency and choice we want to give to our kids, it's the same with our clients, y'all. It's exactly the same, right? 
So I hope this is making sense to you. I hope it's feeling helpful to you. Um, and I would love to hear again your thoughts and feedback on this. You're welcome to always uh, leave a comment or, or send me an email, cambria at cambriaevans.com. Um, but to answer my friend's question about how many resources should I install, the answer is it's client-centered. It's however many your client wants, honestly, to help them go towards the target that we're trying to work on, right? So if I'm getting all my kids' stuff together and we're going on a road trip for 10 hours to you know, my mom's house, I'm not going to bring 25 loveys, right? I might bring a couple, but I'm going to ask my daughters to choose which ones, okay? Um, and just the act of choosing and being a part of the conversation is also reparative. It's also therapeutic towards the client's goals, right? Um, I hope that feels helpful. This is so much fun to talk about this stuff with you guys. I love your questions. I love your comments. You're always welcome to reach out to me with anything else you would like me to talk about on these free resource videos. Um, again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for um, doing miraculous work the last 14 months. And um, I hope all of you are taking a break this summer. I know I will be taking lots of time this summer to hear myself think and have a quiet house and just sit after the kind of um, trauma and crisis we've all been through. So I hope you're giving yourself that as a resource um, because we are allowed to resource ourselves. Uh, in the meantime, y'all just, like I always say, stay healthy, stay safe. And I really do look forward to connecting next time. Be well.